glorify the King of kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of lords, who is the great I am. And Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before his throne. We will worship him in righteousness. We will worship him alone. He is Lord of
So firm is his foundation, no power can overthrow, and he shall reign forever.
Take the communion, let's meditate on the song.
<laughs> Hello, greetings, church. Uh, my name is Steve LaFrance, and I have the privilege of sharing today's message with you. Um, we are in our Keepers series, and if you haven't had an opportunity to listen to the lessons, I want to encourage you to do so. They're in our uh, YouTube page, all the lessons. They've been phenomenal thus far, and I just want to encourage you to listen to them. All right. So healthy societies are built on the premise for concern for your neighbor. To be neighborly has always been an essential part to having a thriving nation, a corporation, a community, and local congregations. Most of us who claim Christianity know the answer to the question, who is my neighbor? Most of the world are at least aware of the teachings which speak volumes about the Christian influence in this world. We have awards called Good Samaritans. The City of Brotherly Love. A bunch of church leaders in Philadelphia were arrested for feeding the homeless in downtown Philly. And when on trial before a judge, one of the church leaders said this law betrays the name of this city. The leaders appeal to a higher sense of ethics and love. They were able to see the poor in Philadelphia as their neighbor. And so today we're going to ask the question, who is my neighbor? And the title of this message is, I am your neighbor. Let's go to Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bound, and bound his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he put the man on his donkey, brought him to an inn, took care of him. The next day... He took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after them, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. You see, the expert in the law, this whole story begins with the expert in the law seeking the, 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 the answer to the question, how can I get eternal life? You see, many Jews in that early period understood the world in two halves, the present age that they were currently living in and the age to come, where God's rule and reign, his justice, his peace and all of that would be established. And so this guy is saying, how do I get a piece of that? So when he says eternal life, he's talking about participating in God's rule right here. And so Jesus says the Torah has the answer. Love God and love people. That's the answer to receive eternal life is to love God and love your neighbor. And so when the expert of the law answers that answers in that way, Jesus says, bingo, you got it. You see, but the expert in the law wanted clarity on who his neighbor was. He expected Jesus to say all faithful people who are wanting God's new age to break in. 
And if Jesus said what he expected him to say, then Jesus would have to give an answer to the peculiar nature of his ministry. Like, why are all these unsavory people coming to the kingdom? You see, the subtext of the question of who is my neighbor really is who am I going to serve and who will I partner with? And am I willing to partner with people who have competing agendas? Am I willing to partner with people who are part of the problem? You see, that's what Jesus helps this man understand with this story of um, the Good Samaritan, as we so call it here um, in the Bible story. And so he sets the story in Jericho. Now, all biblical historians say Jericho is a dangerous place. And so the idea of someone coming into Jericho and being robbed was actually not abnormal. And so we have three characters in this. Well, we have four characters in this story, the victim, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan. And so as the priest is walking by the victim who was beaten and left half dead, we have to remember that priests were bound by the law not to touch anything dead. And so how would the priest have known that the individual was dead? He wouldn't have known. And so he walks by, he saw him, but he walks by. And the Levites were bound by similar rules and similar laws. But both men saw him but they were not moved. It's easy over time to grow numb when you see issues and you see the plights of others. It's easy to turn a blind eye to those situations. You see, these two men missed an opportunity to be an opportunity for others. It's easy for us, not only just thinking about the poor, but to miss opportunities to see people in need of help. Troubled marriages. We hear different things at the workplace of people having issues in their marriage and we could step in and we see the issue, but instead we kind of want to just keep walking. Mental health challenges. We see the issue and sometimes we get overwhelmed even thinking about what it would mean to help someone in that um, life stage, in that life um, situation, but we get tempted and we can see it and we just kind of want to walk by. Substance abuse, those who are harassed and helpless, and those who are lonely. We see all these issues, we're aware of them, and sometimes we just want to walk by. We, we can feel the weight of, man, this is just a lot to, to take on. And I'm almost certain as Jesus is sharing this story, his hearers, the Jews, the, the expert in the law who asked him the question, who's his neighbor? His hearers are like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. They had to walk by. So who's going to be the hero? He says the Samaritan. And what's important is if you get an opportunity, read 2 Kings chapter 17, skim through some of the minor prophets. They have such scathing rebukes for the people of Samaria. There's nothing good about the people in Samaria in the Old Testament. And you have to understand that this idea and this, this, this demograph of people were not, the Israelites were not fond of. And so when Jesus introduces this character as the one who saw him and had pity, again, his, his original hearers would have heard that and say, not this dude. He totally could not have been the individual to see him and have pity. And I want to talk about the pity that he had on this individual. It's like that gut level, like, I just got to do something. I think all of us have been there where we have just seen something or we heard something and something just in, in us just said, I need to act. This is not right. And I need to do something about that. The word that is used for pity is just like that feeling that we all get. It's that, 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 that gut instinct, if you will, to do something. You see, the Samaritan wasn't worried about some of the questions that a lot of us are worried about that I believe even the original audience were worried about. The, the victim had zero name. The victim, we don't know where he's from, who he was, what his background was. The Samaritan saw a need and he just acted. He moved to compassion, moved to pity, to serve this individual. I think too often, it, it, if the victim had a name, in our own personal lives, we want to move. 
Like none of us in here, if we saw Mark Bruno laid out on the side of the road, we'll walk by Mark Bruno. We care about Mark Bruno, so we'll help him out. If we saw Kim, we'll help her out. But that's the thing. We have created neighbors only in so far as we have relationships with people. And what Jesus is trying to do is expand our categories of who our neighbors are and who we ought to be serving. And so the, the guy said, Jesus asked, asked the um, expert in the law, okay, then um, Jesus said, okay, then, then reach one of these guys as a neighbor. And he's like, yeah, the one who showed mercy. He couldn't even say Samaritan. He's like, but the one who showed mercy. Mercy, shorthand definition for mercy is not giving people what they deserve. Sometimes, guys, we get paralyzed from helping people because we're trying to put together a context when we just need a help. Don't worry about the context. God knows the context. If it's within your ability to help, I want to encourage you to be a neighbor to your neighbors. I recently watched the film um, Mr. Rogers. It was an awesome movie. I encourage all of you guys to watch it. It's something you go watch with your family. But one of the things that stood out to me about Mr. Rogers was he was so serious about making sure that he was a good neighbor to everyone he encountered. A good neighbor to the people on set, a good neighbor to the guests he brought on. Like he really was a unique guy. Like he had a little prayer list. He would pray for people and different things like that. And when I think about Mr. Rogers, I think about a man who is fighting to imitate Jesus. Like that's who he was imitating. That's who he was trying to be like. He was trying to be like Jesus. You see, the basic, the basic story has a really deep meaning. This basic story. It's basic because it's like love your neighbor. We get that. But the deep meaning behind it was that the law prevented the Levite and the priest from acting. It prevented them from serving people out of love. And sometimes that can happen if we have a flat reading of the Bible. Jesus elevates two commands in the scriptures. He says, love God and love people. And all the law and the prophet hangs on these two commandments. That's what it says in Matthew 22. Sometimes we have to make sure that we're elevating what Jesus elevates and that we're not simply just having a flat reading as if every command is on the same level before God. I want to encourage us <clears throat> to, if certain rules get in the way of us following Jesus, we always want to make sure we're following Jesus. Like how many of us, if given an opportunity to serve and to give and to, and, and to help someone, would make sure that we prioritize that over and above um, some of our other, other things like if you're on your way to the gym and you want to make sure you live a little bit longer, you know, get your beach body on after this Corona situation is over. And someone says, I need help. Are you willing to stop your car and maybe miss out on your gym day so you can love your neighbor? Or if you see someone and you know you have extra cash on you and they didn't have enough money to cover their groceries in line. Do you just say, hey, I don't know what they got going on, man. Like That's their fault. Or, these, or you move with compassion if you have the extra resources to serve in that way. You see, too many times we're not moved. And then other times we wait until social media moves us. Like if someone famous on social media says we should go out and go love people, we, we are quicker to listen to that person than we are to Jesus, which is super discouraging. We need to be quicker to listen to Jesus than Bon Jovi or whoever else we think is popular on social media. You see, the Samaritan, you see, the Samaritan wasn't spirit filled, but he was gut filled. He was moved by his, in his gut to have pity on the individual who was um, robbed by his neighbors. But we are spirit filled. And so the question is, how are you making your judgments about your neighbor? Is your judgments coming from a place of love, mercy, compassion and wisdom? Or is it coming from a place of being unconcerned, being numb? You can call people to righteousness while still prioritizing love. Many parents do this. It's not put this hat on and take this hat off, but we're able to combine it. 
in terms of calling our children to righteousness while never removing the love we have for them. You see, our neighbor reveals, the question of who is our neighbor reveals the reality of God's kingdom that we are presently living in the age to come, that we are presently living in eternal life by the way that we love people. People will sit back and say, oh, that's what it will be like when new creation begins. The way that we serve and love our neighbors, especially those we don't know. Who is our neighbor? Everyone. How do I love my neighbor? With mercy, love, compassion, and pity. Being there for people during this time of social distancing where they don't have an opportunity to connect with people, especially if we know people don't have um, family or they're, they're in a situation where they're consistently in solo isolation. You see, the gospel is Jesus King of all. And we're all invited to partake in his kingdom. And so when, I, when, when Jesus asks, who, who, when, when, the, when the expert says, who is my neighbor? We, we as Christians should be quick to reply, I am your neighbor. You are my neighbor. I am your neighbor. Anyone next to you is your neighbor. Anyone abroad is your neighbor. You see, we want to be keepers, not only of the brothers and sisters who've made the covenant commitment as us, not only of keepers of the gospel message that we want to proclaim to others, we also want to be keepers of everyone made in the image of God. And so I want to leave us with this one thought and this one challenge. Go do likewise. We have been given the Holy Spirit to be creative. Let's be creative and go do likewise. Go find someone you can serve. Go find someone you could give, give to. Go find someone, not only their physical needs, also serve their spiritual needs. Go share the gospel with someone. Go, sh go set up a Zoom Bible um, study with an individual you have in your phone. But go do likewise. That's Jesus' challenge to us. Go do likewise. Be someone who is a neighbor to someone. If I knew how to sing Mr. Rogers' song, I would. But none of you guys want to hear that. And I don't have um, those lyrics written down. So I'll spare you this time. I love you guys. Let's say a word of prayer as we get ready to take communion. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you so grateful that we are in community with you, that we can um, share in this life, share in the abundance of your mercies, share in the abundance of just your pouring of the Spirit. Lord, you've given us an incredible county to love. We have 2.7 million people who are our neighbors, and then we have Broward further north, and then we have Palm Beach further north, and really the whole world is our neighbors, Father. We pray that you can give us wisdom, courage, and insight, not just to see people, but to be moved with compassion. Thank you so much for our, our, our Lord, that we can imitate him. Thank you so much for the examples within our fellowship and in the world that we can imitate. But Lord, I just pray that you fill us with faith and fill us with conviction and fill us with mercy, pity, and love for our neighbors. We love you, we thank you, and we pray all this in your son's name. Amen.